committee. I'm Councilmember Jose Wezar. I've been joined by Councilmember Marquis Harris Dawson and Councilmember Felipe Fuentes. Uh, we will. Uh, uh, we have a quorum, so we will get started. Uh, if we could first go to item number four, which is a report from the Director of Planning, Mr. Michael Legrand. Good afternoon, Council Members. I have a brief report for you. Um, the department has been aggressively pursuing. Um, the remaining hiring from our budget that was so generously approved by the City Council last year. Um, we're able to make two principal city planner promotions, which are high-level planners that are over geographic or major projects or geographic areas of the city. Um, the two recent promotions of that class are Shauna Bonston um, as well as Tom Rothman. And you may have seen Tom many times with Recode LA and presenting before you. Um, so we're really excited to congratulate those two and as they um, continue to do great work for the citizens of Los Angeles. Additionally, I'd like to update you on um, an important item that the council has been considering. They'll be going to the planning commission um, off-site signs. There's a uh, ordinance A and B, or options A and B, both going before the citywide planning commission this Thursday. So anyone in the attendance or listening, it's going to be a great debate. It'll be out at 8:30 in our Van Nuys um, City Hall. So we'll be taking up the topic of. Um, off-site, on-site signs, um, sign districts, and takedowns. And we expect that to be back before the council this calendar year and back before the committee. And that concludes my report, and I'll be available for any questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Legrand. And so uh, with that, we'll know and file item number four and go to uh, item number one. If you could read that into the record, please. Sure. Uh, Robert from UC Berkeley, who just beat Texas this past weekend. That's right, Councilman. Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> um, item one, Councilman, is a report from the Department of Building and Safety. It's a proposed ordinance to add terms to the municipal code as it relates uh, to provisions uh, that would provide protections for earthquakes. Thank you. Um, there are no speaker cards on this. I would request that we approve draft ordinance and refer to the city attorney to prepare and present the final ordinance. That's okay. Any objections? So ordered. Item number three, if you could please read that into the record, Roberto. Councilman, item three is a report from the City Planning Commission. It's a specific plan amendment to the LAX uh, airport plan. Can we have a brief presentation from staff, please? Good afternoon, council members. My name is Karen Hu with the Los Angeles City Planning Department. Before you is, for your consideration, is an ordinance that would amend the LAX specific plan, specifically that would address the development within the north side sub area of that plan. The amendment would establish comprehensive development regulations that reflect the community's input and current best practices in, des in design and sustainability. The specific plan ordinance establishes updated land use regulations such as you know, what uses are permitted or prohibited, yard area requirements, floor area, height, signage, traffic trip limitations. There's also a brand new design guideline booklet that would replace the existing design guidelines that were developed back in the 1980s. And it's a comprehensive uh, guide to development for the north side that goes into details such as streetscapes, lighting, building design orientation, bicycle parking, street furniture, plant pallets, to just name a few things. Uh, development in the north side will be required to go through an approval process to ensure that it complies with those regulations and also the design guidelines. The City Planning Commission on June 25th considered the specific plan uh, that was proposed by the Board of Airport Commissioners. They made a few modifications to the proposed ordinance to, for clarity and consistency with the, the zoning regulations and the zoning code, and also modified the review procedures so that the Department of City Planning also gets to review it and added additional sustainability measures to the design guidelines. At your pleasure, we also have representatives from LAWA that are ready to provide you more details about the, the specific plan. Sure. Thank you. Lisa Trifoletti, are you going to give us a presentation on this? Yes, and we're having a little bit of technology difficulty, so I'll just speak. 
Uh, greetings, Council Members. I'm Lisa Trifoletti, and I'm pleased to be here uh, before you today to talk about the LAX Northside Plan. Uh, my current role is a Director of Environmental and Land Use Planning, but for the past five years I served as Project Manager, and uh, we are here. We have a technical team to answer any questions that you may have. Our presentation was designed to provide you an overview of the Northside Plan objectives, the purpose, uh, the community process. Uh, we, were, we planned to present to you the urban design concepts that, and show how different today's uh, proposal is from the 1980s adopted plan. And we would like to share with you the sustainability features, the community outreach process, and then address any questions that you may have or that the public may have. Um, we wanted to first of all thank the Office of Council Member Bonin, uh, the Department of City Planning, um, LADOT, Public Works, City Attorney, and the entire city family, including key members of the public that helped make today's uh, plan possible. Uh, by way of background, the LAX North Side is comprised of 340 acres and the land was largely single family homes that were acquired in the 60s and the 70s and 80s uh, with FAA grants. Those FAA grants removed incompatible land usage, which is residential near an airfield, and really charged the airport with coming up with a compatible land use comprised of commercial development. In the 1980s, the airport did rezone the property for 4.5 million square feet. And then in 2004, we incorporated uh, that plan into the uh, LAX specific plan. And that, up to this point, while we've had a lot of entitlements on the books, the plan has never actually been implemented in full force. Um, for years, the community has been calling to utilize this under, you know, this underutilized land, and figuring out how to get FAA approval, council approval, community approval, and have a land use plan that meets the airport needs and the community needs is uh, what what we have been working on for the last five years. We have done a series of updating on the regulations, and those. Those design guidelines are completely out of date. They do not reflect the latest in terms of sustainability. They do not reflect the latest in terms of the, the market. And so that is what we have done today. I'll cut this short. Um, we had a, a, a community process that we are really proud of. We had 50 public meetings and we really took in community input. We have landscape buffers, we have a pedestrian paseo, uh, we have um, limited uses that are not um, acceptable to the members of the public, in terms, such as auto dealerships or retail over 100,000 square feet. And we have effectively down zone heights that were at one point 10 and 12 stories down to 60 feet in height. Uh, we're really proud that this project has widespread community support by a number of groups. And um, I think in terms of the uh, plan moving forward, our job is to work with the planning department to process projects. And we think that this is going to be transformative to the West LA area. And we're here to answer any questions should you have them. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to public comment now. Uh, Denny Schneider, Cindy Hench, Donald Duckworth. One minute, please. Thank you. Mr. President, Denny Schneider, President of RSAC. I'm pleased to tell you that we favor this project. It's a win-win for everybody. And I want to point out uh, what Lisa was saying about community meetings. These were actual meetings where they listened. That's a new concept. So we really thank you and urge you to approve this as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Hench. Hello, my name is Cindy Hench. I'm the president of the Neighborhood Council of Westchester Playa. And what Lisa said is absolutely true. The outreach from LAWA on this project was unmatched, and it's unfortunate we don't see more of it. Um, but in this case, we were happy because it, it's the changes to the Northside plan are significant and in the right direction, so that we hope you um, support this as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Donald Duckworth, uh, Christina Davis. 
Yes, uh, my, my name is Donald Duckworth. I'm the executive director of the Westchester Town Center Business Improvement District. We've been involved with Lawa and Lisa Trifoletti in this project for over four years. Uh, it enjoys unanimous support of the Westchester Bid Board and has uh, received that support on numerous occasions. The board has participated actively throughout the process. In addition to our business organization, which is all the commercial property owners uh, north of the airport um, and, and to the, the residential areas, the Westchester Streetscape Improvement Association, which is a community beautification nonprofit uh, entity, also supports it unanimously. We'd urge you to approve the, the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Christina Davis, Tricia Keene from Council District 11. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Davis, and I'm the president and CEO of the LAX Coastal Chamber of Commerce, which represents the areas surrounding LAX. Our chamber spent many hours um, reviewing the EIR as well as working with LAWA staff on this project. Uh, we can tell you that we are incredibly supportive of what they planned from the open space to the mixed use project with the de higher density closer to our business district. This project really is uh, something that the community worked collaboratively on and we support it uh, wholeheartedly. So I hope you will as well. Thank you. Thank you. Trisha Keene. Good afternoon, Trisha Keene, uh, Director of Land Use and Planning for Councilmember Mike Bonin. I'm here today to speak in strong support of the LAX Northside project. The project will result in an update to the LAX specific plan that has been years in the making and is greatly needed to put the underutilized airport land adjacent to the Westchester community to good use. The council office has been pushing for years to bring sensible positive development to this area and to use this underperforming airport land in a way that would benefit the community. After years of effort and many, many hours of hard work on the part of planning staff, the city attorney, LAWA staff, and community leaders, the project that is before you today does just that. I'd like to thank everyone who has been involved with this project and who worked so hard to get it to the point where we're at today. This is a truly transformative project for the West Side and will welcome creative office, biotech, and other community serving uses to the area. And this was the result, as you've heard today, of a model community outreach process that has resulted in widespread community support for this project, which we're thrilled about. We are happy to be here to support the project and request that your committee approve the proposed project so LAWA can move forward with this as quickly as possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, I must say this is a first where uh, the community agrees with anything that happens at LAX. <laughs> Where's the <op> <laughs> Uh, so congratulations, and uh, I think this is uh, the right way to go about it. I think uh, a clear message was also uh, given to our LAX officials about the type of community outreach that was used here. But uh, overall, um, uh, I don't have any questions. It seems to be going in the right directions. Any other questions, comments? No. Well, thank you. Uh, with no objection, we'll move this item forward to full council. No, council. No, it's a draft. It's We're a draft. approved draft amendment ordinance referred to city attorney to prepare and present final ordinance. Yes, council. And uh, we will most likely waive this out of committee when it comes back and send it to full council once the city attorney has uh, sent over their ordinance so that we can just get directly to council and not have to come back to Plum Committee. Okay. Great. Thank you. So ordered. Thanks. Congratulations. Item number two, please. Uh, item two, councilman is a proposed new zone in the city, the lift work uh, zone. Um, it's a citywide enabling ordinance. So um, if I could start this item off, um, as staff settles in and we change our uh, item, um, after two years of work from the planning department and the unanimous approval of the hybrid industrial ordinance from the city planning commission we heard this item two weeks ago here in this committee uh, while there was a large amount of support we also heard from some who had some questions about this so we provided more time for the planning staff to review and report back today on the alternative technical adjustments that were raised two weeks ago uh, the goal of this ordinance is to provide a citywide zoning tool that promotes the creation of new jobs, new housing opportunities that are affordable and fit the character of our existing industrial areas. And so today we want to hear from the planning staff and then once again open this up for public comment before deliberating as a body on this proposal. So welcome planning staff and if you could uh, give us another brief 
presentation. I uh, want to encapsulate what this is. I know we had this already in Plum, and it's been heard in the City-wide Planning Commission. Also, there's been a number of community meetings, but you could just quickly encapsulate what this is and also let us know the adjustments that we made at the last uh, uh, Plum meeting. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. So, good afternoon, Council Members. I'm Brian Eck with the Department of City Planning. Uh, the proposed hybrid industrial live work zone, which is a new zoning tool um, for our uh, city's zoning code, uh, would enable the uh, regulation of a mix of land uses that we have not regulated today in the city. This includes uh, live work, light industrial, um, creative office, retail, restaurant, uh, and other such uses. Um, this was presented here to the commission two weeks ago, or the committee two weeks ago. To testimony was heard, and there was a discussion on key topics between staff uh, and uh, the committee. So at that meeting, we were directed to make changes to the ordinance, um, and those were submitted in advance of this meeting. Uh, also, the committee requested annual reporting on the use and implementation of this zone, and our department is committed uh, to doing that. Uh, staff was also asked to report back on the arts and productive use requirement. Um, as part of the zone. So as recommended by the City Planning Commission, the Arts and Productive Use provision would require each project uh, to reserve an equivalent of 200 square feet of, uh, per each live-work unit of leasable non-residential space elsewhere in a building. Uh, the recommended alternative from this committee is an approach that scales down that requirement uh, as projects include more units. Uh, this would reduce the relative requirement for larger projects, but then still ensure a minimum amount across projects, both large and small. So probably after the meeting, we looked at a variety of alternative approaches to this um, that are both in line with the City Planning Commission uh, direction and the direction of this committee. Um, so an alternative that uh, better aligns with the intent of the City Planning Commission is through a tiered system that actually tiers the requirement up uh, for just the largest of projects. So under the approach, the tiers would be structured with the lower requirement for the first 400 units, and then after 400, um, use the original 200 square feet requirement. Um, we believe that is really these type projects, the largest projects, um, you know, those with over 400 units that could accommodate um, more flexibly, flexibly the requirement for the non-residential non uh, space, um, and would actually lead to more meaningful large uh, spaces. Um, this is because larger sites presents um, more options for siting and also for the ability to um, perhaps do your project in two or multiple buildings, um, which would lead to uh, um, uh, increases in terms of flexibility in terms of financing and both construction. So our, from our perspective, um, from the planning department, it would be preferable to have fewer but larger and more meaningful non-residential spaces uh, created in the city through this zone is because these are the types of spaces that can attract large anchor tenants and institutional uses. So the, the concentration of large arts and productive use spaces will serve uh, to balance the amount of live-work units in a way that will continue to maintain the employment focus and foster live-work communities in hybrid industrial areas. Um, also during the last meeting, there was a discussion about the potential applicability of the zone. So as a quick reminder, the HI zone is simply proposed as a new zoning tool for the city zoning code, um, and is really just a framework and a new zoning typology. Creation of the zone would not involve any changes to any land use or zoning on any property in the city. This means that any individual project that wants to make use of the zone will be evaluated by the city on a case-by-case -case basis, um, with opportunity for the public to participate in the process. Just like all of the city zones, the HI is silent on where it actually should apply, and therefore might not be appropriate for every hybrid industrial neighborhood in its current form. Um, there are efforts underway, however, um, that could lead to refined versions of the zone that would be better aligned for individual neighborhoods where appropriate. The first opportunity for this is through our city's uh, community planning program. Um, uh, to tailor this more finely. Um, there are, I will say that the majority of our community plan pro, uh, that are currently updating, uh, in the process of being updated, this includes Central City, Central City North, uh, South LA, and West Adams, do include tools and zoning typologies that, um, that are related to hybrid industrial. And so this is an opportunity to further tailor the zone um, more appropriate for those communities. Um, also, it's also worth noting that the Recode LA project, which is now in year three, um, uh, is reconsidering and re-updating our city's entire zoning system. 
um, the project will create an entirely new set of zoning tools that can be an opportunity for more tailored zoning across the range of hybrid industrial land uses. So finally, um, in, re in regards to the technical changes to the ordinance, um, these are still ongoing um, to the ordinance and being in made in consistent, uh, to be consistent with the intent of the City Planning Commission. Notably, the provision related to building code requirements for live work units. The commission approved version specified that live work units be constructed to accommodate factory, mercantile, and business functions within each unit. And we have come to the understanding that perhaps um, how we have um, written the standards in the updated version, um, namely the formula for the occupant load factor, might cause some undue burden on construction by activating other building code requirements that could be met only through type 1 construction. Um, this was certainly not the intent of the City Planning Commission, and therefore staff will continue to work with the Department of Building Safety through our form and legality process uh, to implement these provisions that support the employment functions without causing uh, undue economic hardship. So thank you, and we're available for questions. Great. Thank you. And, and before you uh, oh, we wanted to ask just a few questions and then go to public comment and come back for further discussion. But, yes, certainly. Uh, can you elaborate on how the FAR limitations, uh, minimum unit size, and other requirements in the ordinance are geared toward generating jobs and creative or productive uses? Did you, did you yeah. that? Sorry, can you repeat one more time? FAR limits? You could just elaborate it on how the FAR limitations or the minimum unit size and other requirements in the ordinance are geared towards uh, generating jobs and other creative and productive uses. Uh, Patricia, Diefen no. Pardon. Patricia Diefender for Planning Department staff. Um, thank you. So uh, there are many provisions of the ordinance that are intended to try to ensure that new developments are em employment focused and can provide opportunities for and spaces for jobs. In addition to the higher standard to which the live work units would have to be built in order to accommodate um, five, five at, at, um, a maximum of five um, non-residential employees. There's also the requirement for the non-residential requirement, um, what we call the arts and productive requirement, which we, we talked about a little bit in the presentation. Um, so this is additional leasable non-residential space that's a requirement for every project based on the square foot or the number of live work units. Um, as the committee, the committee instructed uh, staff to amend the ordinance to um, have that tiered structure that was scaled down. We just discussed another option, which is potentially scaling up in order to increase the non-residential requirement as the number of live-work units increases, but that, again, is a, is a, you know, a debate that we can have. So those are um, and the number of ways. The, the unit size, for example, there's um, the requirement that it be a minimum of 750 square feet. That was um, a requirement that was you know trying to ensure that there's adequate space to accommodate some live some work functions within the unit. You also have to reserve within the unit 150 square feet, show, sort of show on plans 150 square feet that's allotted for the work function. Um, there there's some debate about whether 750 square feet is large enough. Um, it, it's you know the sense of the planning department. I think the commission agreed that. Seven, many different kinds of uses can be conducted within a 750 square foot space. Many people work on their computers. Um, you know, you don't have to have very large spaces to to be able to conduct work in those spaces. So, as a means to try to, um, you know, make sure that the cost of these units are are accessible to a wide range of incomes, it, there's it was sort of the policy objective to keep those units large enough to accommodate work functions, but not too large. So I hope that answered some of your questions. And, and, and finally, my other question now is, can, can you let us know what is the building and safety process whenever there is a proposed demolition of a building built before 1965? Or is there, I don't know if planning has that answer, or building and safety if you're here. Sure. Nick Marisich from the City Planning Department. So the city did adopt an ordinance. Um, um, recently actually in 2014 that, that does address uh, notification of demolition and that was requested by the council. So um, that ordinance requires that uh, for um, where, where there was an original building permit uh, for a building issued more than 45 years um, prior than the, to the date of application for demolition, um, then uh, the Department of Building and Safety has to send written notices of that demolition pre-inspection. 
uh, to the abutting property owners as well as the council office. And there's additional notification given to our Office of Historic Resources as well. Um, and that um, allows for a 30-day um, process to, um, to take place. They also have to post um, on the property a public notice of the application for that. Um, so that is uh, something that exists today. There's also, um, you know, building permits for demolition if they're in a redevelopment area continue to be reviewed by um, the successor agency to the CRA, um, and they um, do also review those those permits as well. So there's a number of reviews that happen now um, for buildings of, of a certain age. So any building built uh, prior to within 45 years, uh, after 45 years, before 45 years, um, gets. Uh, Fifty years. Patricia okay. Diefender for, for the record. Years um, it's forty-five years in the ordinance. 45, yeah. Okay. Forty-five years gets uh, is required to have notification to the local co council office, the Office of Historic Resources. Correct. Right. And, and I understand currently property. Survey LA is going to begin some work in November of 2015 in the Arts District, in particular, to look at what are potentially historic uh, buildings. And uh, but no building that is designated as a historic resource. I mean, there has to be a CEQA analysis and all that. It could be overridden, but uh, but building safety wouldn't... I mean, there's protections for historic resources, correct? Patricia Diefender, for, for the record, yes. Yeah, there, okay. As we outlined, there's a number of different um, safeguards for that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I got others, but yeah, Mr. Fuentes. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I'm a little confused here because I think what I heard is a little bit different than the third draft. That is, is, so is there a fourth draft? And here's where my confusion is. It's, it's around the floor area ratio. And I think when we were here last, uh, there was a scaled down proposal that you are all asked to analyze 150 square feet per live work unit for the first 50 units, 100 square feet per live work unit for any units in excess of the 50, but not exceeding the 100. And then lastly, the 50 square feet for the remainder. And it sounded as if uh, you've done the analysis along that scaled-down version, but you're proposing something for a building of 400 units or more. Is that right? Patricia Diefendover, for the record. It's not in my draft. Here, right. So. It's, it's something that the committee directed us to come back and report on. So right. the, the ordinance, the most recent ordinance that was submitted, made the changes as instructed by the committee on September 8th. And that's the scaled-down version. So right. that's what you see in your ordinance. The committee also instructed us to come and report back on a potential alternative, and so our report was on that alternative of scaling up, which we can answer any so, questions So help about. me understand how that alternative works, because the concern that I had, and I'm glad that the chair asked for the analysis, the concern that I had with this scaled-down approach is, at least it, by my math, it feels that it de-emphasizes the need for industrial or productive use as the projects get larger in size. From a proportion perspective, it felt like, at least by some examples that I ran myself, it seems like it de-emphasizes that. And if the goal here is to have a hybrid industrial zone, we don't want to take too much uh, emphasis away from that. So I understand it's a Goldilocks thing, right? How much is good, how, how little is, is bad, and, and, and finding the sweet spot. So help me understand with your analysis what what, uh, what the latest thinking is that, that okay. would. So I can provide and that. And if I could just uh, uh, clarify even further, and this is for the more general space. It's not the individual units. Not right? within the, the live individual work. units that stays. Right. This is talking right. the overall. Right. No, the and, and, and I think yeah. that's important because the individual space, I mean, it's going to be whatever it is. It's 200 square feet, and we can't, right, per unit? Sorry, the, this is, there's a lot of different numbers. Patricia Diefender, for the record. The live-work units have a set of standards associated with them. One of the standards to be constitute a live-work unit is that you Id identify 150 square feet within the minimum okay. average 700 square, 750 square feet unit that is allotted for workspace. That is what is occurring within the live-work unit. Right. There's also additionally a requirement for non-residential space that's outside of the live work units in order to have the mix of uses. It's essentially requiring a mix of the uses. Now, the question before us is one of how much should that non-residential square footage requirement be? Right. So if I could continue to answer your question by trying to explain, give, give a couple of examples and show what the different 
um, non-residential square footage requirements would be based on the, the different alternatives that we've been looking at. So to start with, Commission approved a draft that said that 200 square feet of non-residential space would be required per unit. It was a straight across the board requirement, okay? The, the committee in our discussions on September 8th offered the idea that perhaps a tiered structure would be um, appropriate and and staff generally agreed that it, a tiered structure could would be appropriate and consistent with the action of the commission however again the difference is whether we tear up whether the the requirement increases as the number of live work units increase or whether the requirement decreases as the number of live work units increase so um, in order to demonstrate that let me give a couple of examples if we have a 60 unit project okay uh, by the the committee's alternative, um, there would be a six. Sorry, I'm sorry. One second. I'm confused by that. One, one second. Right. Okay. So the the commission would have required twelve thousand square feet. Okay. The committee's alternative, which is in the draft ordinance currently, would require eighty five hundred square feet. So a reduction, but still a. a you know, a somewhat significant component. The option that, um, the alternative that we're discussing that, that staff has come, has, is offering um, is one in which by scaling up, so you reduce the requirement for the smaller project. So that option would result in 6,000 square feet of non-residential space for that 60 unit project. So help me so, understand the math. So, so the, the 12,000 is easy because that's a CPC. It's right. 200 it's times 200 60 units. even. Right. The 8,500 is this tier down version. Is the tier down where you... 6,000, how do you get to the 6,000? The 6,000... I might want you to read into the... Okay. So, Nick Marisa, let me just read into the, the record, because um, I know you don't have it in front of you, but what um, Brian presented um, and what we uh, came up with through our staff analysis um, is the following formula. It would involve 100 square feet per live work unit for the first 100 units, 150 square feet for any units between 100 up to 400, and then 200 square feet per unit for any units in excess of 400. So, Patricia, do you over again? Just to come back to the example then, you can see how it actually, that tiering structure lowers the requirement for the, pro the smaller project, like the 60 unit project. But if we contrast that with a, an example of a larger project, like a 400 unit project, the, the CPC version would have required 80,000 square feet. The, the plum alternative, the scaled down alternative, would put the requirement at about 27,500 square feet. And then the, the alternative that we're discussing, the scaled up alternative, would bring that requirement to about 55,000 square feet. So while it's double what the the plum alternative is, it's still 30% less than the CPC um, version of the ordinance. And again, the rationale there is that if you're doing a 400 unit project, your site is lo lo likely to be in the scale of about two and a half acres. So you have a fairly large site that you're working with, as opposed to the 60 unit project where you probably have a half acre site that you're working with. In that two and a half acre site, you have more flexibility about how you can arrange the uses on the site. You could conceivably build you know, more than one building on the site and deal with some of the financing issues that were raised, you know, the, the, the consideration of when you're mixing the uses that significantly, financing structures looked, they're either for residential buildings or commercial buildings, but something that mixes them um, more, you know, more than just your typical mixed use becomes complicated from a financing standpoint. So also, as, as I think Brian mentioned, you get concentrations of larger spaces rather than kind of smaller, disjointed spaces spread out through a lot of different projects. You, you get a sort of concentration of those spaces that will be, you know, likely to be more functional, can house more like anchor tenants and things like that. So that is our, you know, sort of rationale for why that alternative is something that, you know, we should discuss and consider. And um, that's, that's our... That, that, that's really helpful, and, and I think it, it uh, memorializes what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, I, I will defer to the chair, but it seems to me that the envelope with which you would have to be able to build and meet these requirements in a 
larger project really honors the, the policy goal. So I, I, I actually like that very much. The, uh, the other question that I've got is uh, it sounded as if uh, the limitations to these zone changes um, were more specific than what I'm reading on the August 13th uh, CPC uh, draft. It, it sounds like uh, uh, that this zone could be put pretty much anywhere in the city of Los Angeles. Is that right? It's, uh, where it says here, where the community plan general plan and land use map includes the hybrid industrial land use designation and the HI zone as a corresponding zone. So, uh, I mean, if, if we were to adopt this and sort of get through the the rigor or more that we need to, to to get it in, would GPAs then be able to be filed throughout these industrial corridors? I mean, anywhere in the city of Los Angeles? Patricia Diefender, for the record. So this is kind of a complicated thing. Um, the, there are only two plans currently that have the hybrid industrial land use designation. Many of the community plans that are being updated and in our industrial land use policy study identified areas throughout the city that are that have these characteristics that maybe lend themselves to this mixed use industrial hybrid industrial kinds of uses. So while there are only two community plans that actually have that land use designation on the plan map today currently, there are all, many community plans that are in progress um, are contemplating adding that hybrid industrial land use designation, at which time then this zone would be a corresponding zone of that designation, and then people could conceivably seek a, a general plan amendment, which has to be initiated by the city, and so it has to be initiated with the support of the city, but it, it becomes possible to do so. Does it have to be? So, I mean, so like in a residential development, I am I mistaken where developers come in and initiate it and the city doesn't? This would be different. No, no. So let me just clarify, too. In the ordinance, the limitations of, this, of the zone, it says that it has to be within an area that's currently designated and zoned for industrial use. So you couldn't initiate or ask for this to be initiated in a residential area. I see. So we, we put would... these eligibility criteria yeah. in the ordinance for that reason. Okay. Any other questions for now? Uh, okay, let's go to public comment. And uh, just for the record, I uh, in this committee, uh, once we start an item, we no longer take public comment cards. So anybody who does want to speak, I'll allow somebody to submit them, but we don't take them after the item has begun. And I'll call three names at a time, uh, one minute each to speak. And as you come up, um, if you can restate your name again, please, for the record. Gabrielle Newmark, Gwinnell Go, one name, and Laura Velke. Do 
not allow the demolition of any building constructed prior to 1965 unless an approved building permit for the same site is on hand. Maintaining the wonderful landscape of factories and warehouses is critical while making sure that new buildings add value and not detract. Please make sure that buildings are constructed with a column beam system to preserve the building flexibility to change in the future. We must avoid the prototypical stucco boxes that are covering the entire city. Nora Velke, Jamie Bennett, and Brogan Bam Brogan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Weezer and committee members. My name is Laura Velke, and I'm a community activist in the Arts District, a board member of the HCNC, a founding member of Arts District Community Council, and a founding member of both the La Raba and the HCNC Land Use Committees. I am here to represent the vocal majority, which is now over 500 community members strong. That statement is backed by hundreds of verified signatures signatures and letters all from the Arts District community. While we do not have an army of paid lobbyists representing us, we delivered our community's message with a loud and clear voice. This is the wrong course for the AD. The Arts District is pro-business, pro-development, and most importantly, pro-community. Yet this ordinance serves to destroy the very fabric of what we achieved here, all at the direction of the actual vocal minority. The following must be maintained at all costs if our community established over 30 years ago has any hope of survival. 1.5 FAR for commercial productive uses. It must increase the minimum average size unit to 1,000 square feet. Affordable housing must be dedicated to artists as defined by HUD. Construction types 1, 2, and column and being construction, and there should be no demolition of any building constructed prior to 1965. If this cannot be done, please carve the Arts District out of this ordinance. Thank you. Folks, I'll leave it up to you, but we have about two hours worth of public comment. If we clap in between each member, we could probably add a half hour. I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> Uh, Jamie Bennett, uh, Brogan, Bam Brogan. Uh, my name is Jamie Bennett. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of SciArc, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, which landed 15 years ago in the Arts District. has been very happy there as its home. We moved from Santa Monica. Um, I'm involved with the Business Improvement District, La Raba, on the boards of those organizations and others in the community. We were working towards, with the planning department, a, an arts district specific ordinance, and we're quite excited about it. We were, that disappeared off of the horizon not long ago, and the next thing we found out is we've been included in this, this ordinance. And unfortunately, we believe, and I think the developers believe, that what this ordinance will give the city is a lot of fast, cheap, type 5 stucco box construction for housing. And unfortunately, the Arts District, which is so vibrant right now, will not be assured with all of these uh, things that have been proffered in the, in the ordinance, will not be assured that it won't look like the rest of Los Angeles. So, thank you. Thank Brogan, you. Brogan, Bam, Brogan. <clears throat> Annie Ocasian, Mark Borman, Tamir Babelia. Bila. Hello. Oh, no. My name is Ani Ocasian. I'm the Director of Programs for Impact Hub Los Angeles. We're a co-working space in a community center for about 300 social entrepreneurs, and we're located in uh, the Arts District, and we're very happy there. It's a vibrant community. I'm here to echo the same um, provisions that we're asking for with the rest of the community le leaders. I'll go ahead and uh, repeat some of them. Uh, please make sure that there's 1.5 floor area ratio for commercial and productive uses is maintained. Please make sure that the average unit side does not go below 1,000 uh, 1, square feet. Please make sure that the affordable housing is dedicated to artists, the core of the community. Please make sure that the buildings are constructed with a column beam system uh, to preserve the building flexibility of the future. And please do not allow the demolition of uh, buildings constructed prior to 1965, which make up so much of the character of the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mark Borman. Tamir Babelia. Yes, my name is Tamir. Oh, pardon me. Excuse me. Um, I live in the Arts District for over 10 years now, and I've seen it change over the years, and not always for the better, and I would love to see the charm of the original Art District maintained for years to come, and for generations to come. So, 
I, I kind of repeat just the main things of what people have said over here. First of all, maintaining a minimum size unit is very important. I hear some of the things that people are talking about here. A uh, working area of 100 square foot or even 200 square foot, and it frankly makes me laugh. Um, I live and work in my loft, so I know what it's like. A thousand square foot is the absolute minimum. It's still small. I wish it could be bigger. But at least, if anything, make sure that that's the minimum. Um, the other thing is that I've seen a lot of my friends who are artists that don't make much money, and they're slowly, slowly being driven out because of the rising rents and everything. And it's ridiculous, some of the stuff that we talk about, affordable housing, and those affordable housing are not going to the people Thank who you, actually... Sir. Go Your ahead. time is up. Oh, sorry. You just got to be fair with everybody. John? Sure. Mr. Hi, I'm Brogan, Ben Brogan. Um, You're been, back. I'm back. All right. Good to meet you. I'm a founder of a technology company at, uh, down in the Arts District. We currently employ uh, 55 people, and we'll probably be up to about 150 uh, by this time next year. Uh, I don't think this provision is uh, a good one for the Arts District in particular. We like the ability to do the great things that we're doing. Thank you. Mark Borman. The spine of the proposed ordinance is to create jobs and preserve the neighborhood character through flexible housing. While this is a great concept, it is just that, a concept without any economic study. Further, while it may work in some areas, it certainly does not work in all of them, especially the area known as the Arts District, while it will sanitize our neighborhood and stifle our vibrant economy. As a developer in the Arts District for the past decade, and had the pleasure in working in all asset classes, I am by definition an expert in the field of real estate development and the area. This ordinance is highly flawed in our neighborhood and will create zero jobs that can support the level of affordability to actually live in one of the units. This anticipation of this ordinance passing is fueled speculation that has rendered many buildings economically obsolete, where the only viable option is to bulldoze them. As fiduciaries to the city, it is irresponsible to support an ordinance that is intended to create jobs where no economic studies have ever been done. It is a mistake to believe this ordinance is compatible as written with all intended areas it touches. I strongly uh, suggest this committee either postpone the support or Thank remove you. the Arts District. Thank you. John Given, George Rollins, and Mark Puente. Good afternoon, committee members. John Given on behalf of La Raba Arts District Community Council and individual Arts District uh, stakeholders. I previously submitted letters to the CPC and to Plum, and I submitted a letter in response to the Plum amendments today, which you may have before you. Uh, my clients still assert, as in the previous letter, that the ordinance is not exempt from CEQA and must undergo appropriate environmental review prior to consideration by the city. The letter that I submitted today primarily addresses two of the Plum Amendments and raises the stakeholder concerns regarding potential conflicts between the ordinance and the LA River Improvement Ordinance. The main uh, amendment that, that my letter addressed today dealt with the uh, tiering system that the Plum Committee uh, proposed. It would effectively cut uh, arts and productive use set aside from 200 square feet by up to two-thirds for large projects. This is far lower than the 100 square feet that the CPC specifically rejected and it's contrary to the purpose of the ordinance to preserve land for jobs and to foster job creation. Uh, I am encouraged by planning's uh, inverse tiering, but this was not presented to the community before today, so we reserve the right to analyze and make additional comments. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, George Rollins. Um, I was elected to represent the residents in the Arts District of the HCNC, been down there 40 years. We've heard from your uh, planning people. I'm sure they're well qualified. I doubt if they've ever built a building, developed a piece of property, or created a community. Uh, you've heard from the, uh, the merchant builders, uh, the big box boys, uh, uh, where bottom line is what's going on. Um, if you like the Arts District, if you like downtown, and the revitalization that's taken there in the last 35 years, why don't you listen to the people that did it? We were there. You had an opportunity to talk to us. You pretended to talk to us, but you didn't really talk to us. So no one thing. This ordinance is a land grab by merchant builders who want to build 
more stucco crap in your city. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Puente. I'm a resident downtown. I'm here representing with uh, the uh, uh, SB uh, DTLA Society for Preservation of Downtown Los Angeles. And in the effort of saving time, I echo all of the points that were uh, brought up earlier, uh, with emphasis on three. One is the uh, the square footage. I do believe that uh, under a thousand square feet is uh, is a bit much, um, and that the buildings that are constructed would be constructed in a manner that they can be changed in the future. That would be the column and beam system, as well as uh, uh, the demolition of any building constructed prior to 1965. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rand Boitner, Alex Hertzberg, and Christina Lee. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Boitner, and I'm the president of ADCCLA and a property owner at the Art District. Uh, I, I think it's very clear to all of us that uh, we are in front of a fundamental decision that is going to change the Art District as we see it. Don't take my word of it. Look at The Economist, last edition. September 16 and what they have to say about the decision that is in front of you. Um, I urge you to rethink the application of HI to the Art District and at least if you, do, if you would like to adopt this uh, ordinance, exempt the Art District. Uh, there was a, just before us a community that came from North uh, LAX and look what kind of support the city worked with them and what kind of a support they were able to bring to this committee none of the residents and none of the organization operating within the district support this ordinance. I urge you to take this into consideration, work with foresight, and don't be later sorry when you look at hindsight at the decision that you're going to make today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for listening. My name is Alex Hertzberg. I'm here as the executive director of the SPDTLA. That's the Society for the Preservation of Downtown Los Angeles. Um, I am concerned uh, for the future integrity of the Arts District should it uh, not be dropped from this ordinance. The HI ordinance has uh, immense value in certain neighborhoods, just not this one. Um, the Arts District is a unique destination amongst the 12 districts of downtown Los Angeles. We urge you to maintain the integrity of this neighborhood and not allow it to fall prey to the opportunists who may not have its best interests at heart. Uh, it's a very special time, and there are certain bells that can't be unrung. So I thank you for your time. Christina Lee. Not here. Paul Solomon. Carrie Johnson. And John Kalow. Um, so my name is Paul Solomon. Um, I started a company called Linear City. We ended up developing the toy factory lofts, the biscuit company lofts, um, and other projects on Traction Avenue in the Arts District. Um, I found myself either working with uh, the city or against the city in various ways over the last 15 years, and I feel like when we've worked together, we've uh, propelled the neighborhood forward in a very productive way, and I think the, what it is now is in part a result of that, and now to find myself working, let's say, not with, but uh, unfortunately against the, uh, the planning department and perhaps the council office is sad for me, because we know each other for a while now, and we've worked productively in the past. So I think we're not so, so far apart, and perhaps there's still a way to uh, get together and collaborate where you have the neighborhood and the the developers who've been successful in the area supporting what's happening here as opposed to working against it. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Johnson, and I own and operate a business, Urban Radish, in the Arts District. I'm also a resident of the community. I employ 35 individuals full-time at living wages, many of whom are considered at risk. Like many here, I believe the zoning proposal being contemplated threatens the unique fabric and authentic character of the community, which makes it so desirable for living and business investment. Speaking from personal experience and motivation, it is precisely because the Arts District had not paved the way to low-cost, small-format, cookie-cutter housing development that made the area so appealing for investment. 
In the case of Urban Radish, it was me and my partners believing so strongly in the value of the neighborhood's authenticity that we put the majority of our life savings behind a business which was recently named one of the top six destination grocery stores in the United States. I believe the proposed zoning ordinance has a long-term risk of thwarting individual small and large business investment, the creation of new jobs, and the elevation of the community within the greater Los Angeles area. I ask that you please require unit size to be more than 1,000 square feet. consulting firm Craig Lawson and Company here representing 360 Alameda and their desire to do some um, development in the Arts District area. We're very supportive. As a land use consultant, has done a lot of work in the area. My firm and I are very supportive of the ordinance moving forward. I have two issues that I'd like to just bring to your attention and have further look at. One is the occupancy issue that was raised and how many um, employees will actually be in will be in the unit itself. Um, you know, five, un five employees makes sense, but the occupant load as is defined in the ordinance could take it up over 10, and that seems a little um, unrealistic to me for some of the size of these units. The second issue is the arts and productive uses. I'm very happy to see that there's been some movement on that because I think that's going to be problematic for projects getting their financing. I do think that the tiering system they have now is, is even more problematic for the smaller sites because 
um, it's, an, it's an unusual mix of units, and we don't have the flexibility. And I'll just highlight by saying that the, the uh, industrial land use policy talked about smaller size uh, sites throughout the area as the typical. Thank you. Justin Smith. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dustin Smith. I'm Vice President of Development for Equity Residential. For those of you unfamiliar with our company, we own several multifamily communities in LA, including property in the Arts District, Little Tokyo, Chinatown, and several other communities downtown. We are also, we're also developing the high-rise community at the corner of Fourth and Hill. Um, as the owner of a community in the Arts District, perhaps some of the residents here actually live in one of our buildings, but I'm here to offer support for the hybrid industrial live work zone and the corresponding ordinance being proposed and I'm happy to hear that the arts and productive use standard and the occup occupancy calculation is being relooked at so with that thank you for your time thank you hello I'm Ben Brasso with Camden we own two and a half acres in the arts district uh, and strongly support the ordinance. This has been a long time coming, and we did urge the uh, committee to please push forward this uh, this ordinance. I'd like to remind the committee of just two things. One, every project, specific project that comes before you, will still have to go through this. Just this ordinance just creates a toolbox uh, for additional projects to go through the same process. So there will be a public process with several uh, with several hearings, including CPC, Plum, and all the way up to City Council. So they're We've plenty of opportunity to prevent uh, stucco boxes. The second point I'd like to make uh, is that the that I've heard a lot today about the average unit size needing to be increased. I just remind uh, this committee that the adaptive reuse ordinance currently on the books that's been wildly successful requires a minimum of 450 square foot units uh, in a day and age where things are getting smaller, live spaces and workspaces. Uh, we encourage you to keep with the planning departments. Thank you. And um, just if I could add something here since it was brought up, and uh, that is that the demand and pressure to build in the Arts District or anywhere in the city is there. Whether or not we have this ordinance, a project will be proposed and there has to be a community process that takes place. And even if we don't have this ordinance, that would happen. If we have this ordinance, this is just one option by which if somebody wants to take advantage of some additional discretionary approvals you would have to follow these guidelines it's going to be one of many other things that could happen so I get the issue of protecting the character of the arts district that's something that I've been fighting for for a very long time and I get the issue of not having stucco boxes at the arts district which is something that I've had a lot of proposals come through our office and I say no we're not going to do that that kills the character of the arts district but I just want to be clear at least from my perspective and anybody who comes up correct me if I'm wrong or say my thinking is wrong. This is just one of many of the options that anybody who wants to do anything in the Arts District or any industrial area in the city can take advantage of if they need discretionary approvals. They would have to build additional community benefits such as affordable housing, additional live workspace. So it, it, the design of the Arts District is still, uh, the design of any project that gets proposed for the Arts District is still going to go through a community process, still have the same vetting whether or not this ordinance exists or not. I just want to make that my view of this. The planning department is nodding yes. I may be wrong, but if anybody has a different opinion as we continue to talk about this, please let me know because I really don't see the threat in this as it's been proposed by some. I do see the threat on a project-by-project -project basis whether or not we like that project, and it's going to go through any the public hearing process whether or not. So this is not going to kill everything. If anything, you guys should hold planning department or the local council office accountable for any project that gets proposed but this is just one of many other tools that could be used I, I just had to clear that up uh, Dana Sales John Horvat Alex Animos Dana Sales with 360. I'm actually here today representing myself and our firm. Um, I want to say that I'm supportive of any process in this city that facilitates production of housing and visitor serving uses in some of these areas that are clearly transitioning. 
Um, I also support any policies that protect existing higher intensity industrial uses in these areas from this transition as it happens. Um, last meeting I testified that I don't believe that there should be a height limit attached to this ordinance. While I, while I understand it's planning's intent to promote compatibility, most of these areas are in our height district one that have no current height limit, and the planning department is saying that if you build housing, you now have a height limit. We can build office, we can build creative office, we can build um, retail, we can build anything with no height limit, but if you have housing, now you have a height limit. As a planner, I'm opposed to any policy that differentiates um, by product type. Uh, I support the committee adopting this ordinance, but I also support them promoting any flexibility that allows designers and developers to produce creative, adaptable spaces for today and for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello, John Rovat with Camden, a property owner in the Arts District. I just want to remind everybody uh, here on Plum and in the, in the audience here that we have a housing crisis in this city, and trying to solve a housing crisis by making large, expensive units does not serve the needs of this community and what we need right now. I support the process. I support this ordinance. I support having a process where each individual project goes through a very rigorous and thoughtful review by the community, by planning, by the council office. I also want to express my complete support for giving a preference to artists for the affordable housing units within the district. I've spent a fair amount of time personally investigating how that works and would encourage you to, uh, to make that a requirement of the ordinance. That's something we support very, very strongly. Thank you very much for your time today. Hi, thanks for the chance to speak. My name is Alex Anamos. I'm an architect with Lorcan O'Hurley Architects, and I'm also the uh, co-chair of the American Institute of Architects Urban Design Committee. Um, the Urban Design Committee is a community of design professionals working to create an increasingly vibrant, beautiful, world-class city. And in response to the LA's housing crisis, we support well-conceived urban planning policies that bring much-needed housing online, but also demand good design. Uh, I think the hybrid industrial loop work zone ordinance does this, and by requiring and ins or incentivizing pedestrian plazas, paseos, facade transparency, sensitive massing, art murals, art murals green walls, etc., uh, the, the, the HI zone requires designers create buildings that have great engagement with their neighbors and their neighborhoods. In addition, there are forward-thinking parking and vehicle policies in the zone ordinance that acknowledge the urban character of the areas that it'll apply to. Uh, and uh, I Thank congratulate you. the planning uh, officials. Alexander Sex, Dr. Josh Albrechtson, Dan Arguello. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Sachs. I'm a property owner in the Arts District. Uh, I'd first like to commend planning. They spent two years of their lives trying to get an ordinance together, talking with the community, talking with the owners, talking with the stakeholders down there. I think they've done a very good job. I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Josh Abrexen. Um Just this morning, you guys stood on the steps of City Hall and said there's a crisis of homelessness. First off, thank you very much. But right now we also have a crisis for the amount of housing we have here in, in Los Angeles. We are not building enough to keep up with the amount of people who want to live here in LA and we need to build more to keep up. We need more walkable neighborhoods where people can enjoy the place, they could get to the public transportation, and they could work in the same place. The, me the Arts District is going to have a metro in about three to five years and it makes perfect sense that this is the place that you should try to build housing. And I urge you guys to actually pass this ordinance and make it easier to build housing. Now with my remaining 17 seconds, please make the housing look good. No ugly stuff, no ugly boxes. You know, I want a design review. I want it to fit in, but I want it to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council members. My name is Dan Arguello. I'm here representing the Chamber of Commerce for uh, Lincoln Heights. And speaking only for Lincoln Heights, this ordinance works for us, okay? So we want to thank you, continue to do the good work. And of course, in, in government, uh, as we know, it's very hard to please all the people all the time, but let's try to do that this time around. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter Gerns, Jesse, Paul, Martin, 
Norcan O'Hurley. O'Hurley. Peter Gerns, Fox Eight Studios. Um, I, I, we've had a couple meetings here, and, and I, I don't really hear a lot of opposition. I got some phone calls about shutting down this ordinance this week, and I don't hear anyone sh trying to shut it down. I hear people trying to protect the authenticity of the Arts District, which is wonderful, but from what I understand, I mean, the Arts District came about by adaptive land use, permitting of reuse of buildings to create that zone, and as a property owner in Central North Community, that affects us. We'd like more Arts Districts. Um, my property is on Washington, industrial area in Washington, and it will benefit from the live-work units. This ordinance allows. If the ordinance is not approved, I cannot use my building as a live-work area. As a professional artist and photographer with offices in New York and L.A., I support the ordinance because it will provide jobs and bring new housing into industrial areas. Council members, as a property owner, I urge you to listen to all the segments of our diverse communities and approve this ordinance. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Jesse Palmar, and I support the ordinance. My family is a proud owner of a uh, value produce property in our district of Santa Fe. Uh, the area is changing, and I believe that this ordinance will help foster compatible development as well as housing to other industrial areas within the city. Uh, we've been there for over 40 years, and uh, I speak for other business owners as well who want to see the, uh, the changing environment succeed. Um, I believe that the ordinance is good for business as people will make the areas their home, which now I don't know many people who do. Uh, for this and other, reason, other reasons, I urge you, Commissioners, to please approve this ordinance. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Council member, Members. My name is Lorcan O'Hurley, founding principal of Lorcan Early Architects, and I support this ordinance. As an architect with over 75 projects over three uh, continents, I ask you to support this ordinance. I support the ordinance because it creates a roadmap of the future. It sets a framework to do good architecture, great architecture that really embraces the culture, uh, arts district, and other areas. And it's critical to this. This art ordinance allows for that to happen. The hybrid industrial live work zone will have a positive transformation of the arts district as well as other industrial areas in the city. I am supportive of a strong urban design vision that maintains the character of these industrial areas. The ordinance will allow designers to shape an exciting and bold new city that makes possible a better standard of living for all. I believe this ordinance will accomplish this. Please support the ordinance. Thank you. Jared Stein, Jeffrey Berkmeyer, Lorena Porras. Council member, my name is Jared Stein. I'm both a resident uh, in the Arts District at 7th and Bridge and a uh, business owner, co-founder of The Springs on Mateo Street. I moved to the Arts District, and I say specifically to the Arts District from New York City, not to Los Angeles, but to the Arts District to both live and to create my business because of the unique characteristic of the neighborhood, the unique landscape, and the unique community. We opened a business that helps to support that community. The ordinance as it's currently drafted, I don't think supports the community or the unique characteristic or landscape of the community. I echo the sentiments of my fellow neighbors uh, and business owners in the Arts District to include the provisions that have been presented to you, and if those cannot be included, then to please exclude the Arts District from this ordinance. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Berkmeyer. Uh, I went to SciArc uh, starting in 2001, bought a building on South uh, Santa Fe in 2007, and currently am a developer in the area. Um, basically, what, what I see here is I, I, I'm actually encouraged because I see such a powerful outpouring of support from a community that is basically looking at this and saying, what's wrong with this provision? And to reiterate the same points, one of the reasons for the rise of the Arts District was because of these larger uh, apartment units, um, the, a type of construction that allowed for flexibility, which is inherently not accommodated by Type 5 construction, uh, and also just maintaining the, the, the quality of the, the uh, urban landscape of the, of the Arts District. So if these things can't be accommodated by this, I would ask you to, to excise the Arts District from this provision. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lorena. I own a business in the Arts District. I'm also a resident. Um, 
lucky enough to have a business business that was built in is in a building that was built in 1904. It was developed by somebody who maintained the integrity and didn't care about the square foot per unit. Um, I'm going to ask that you consider the provisions for the arts district and um, if not exclude us, exclude the district from that zoning. Um, that's all. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs> Joseph Fritzelli, E.B. Chimeria, Sarkis Martanian. Chaveria here, no? Okay, Sarkis. So many familiar faces. Um, I work and live in the Arts District. Ten years. Lucky to be here. I hear community. I hear uh, job creation. I, cre I hear Arts District. 95% of the developers here that are for the ordinance don't live here. They have zero stake in this community. Everybody else lives and works here. So we know what's good for us. People from the outside who want to develop, want to build, all they care is about that rent check. Everything they're building doesn't attract the local artist. People come here because it's the Arts District. We have tourism people coming here because of the Arts District. Once you get rid of the artist out of the Arts District, you get rid of the district, period. It's kind of a joke. Leave us out of that ordinance. Tiffany Demers, Heather Gwen Martin, Damon Martis, Ramon Martis, Damon Martis, one of the two. Hi, my name's Heather Gwen Martin. I'm a homeowner in the loft building in the Arts District, and I'm also a working artist. And I was attracted to the Arts District for its character and the functional space that I was available to have to live and work in. Um, I think the Arts District is what it is now because of the people it has attracted, based largely on those qualities. And I think it would be a shame for that to fall away and it to melt into the rest of Los Angeles instead of staying a strong community. And so I ask that future development consider that who it's attracting so that we can continue to build a community of creative people, artists, and have this asset to me. I mean, Los Angeles is becoming a huge art center. There are tons of artists here. People are noticing around the world, and I think it's an asset to the rest of Los Angeles, and we can't work in places that aren't flexible, aren't large, and surrounded by, you know, people who we can't collaborate with, or we can't share a growth Damon Martin, and I am uh, an artist that uh, lives in the Arts District. Uh, I'm also a member of Arts District Alliance and ACME, the All-City Mural Endeavor. Uh, as an artist, I travel constantly all over the world, and, you know, I'm visiting with various arts districts, and I often meet with various councils and various developers. And, you know, we have some characteristics, long-term strategies in mind here with the, the people who live in the neighborhood. We're committed to a successful arts district, not just for how we are, you know, relate to the downtown Los Angeles area, but to the entire city. We are a dimension to the city. That's the capacity we have to become a dimension of the city. The arts district is a sensitive concept. In other words, it's vulnerable. And we are the gatekeepers of, that, of the characteristics that are long-term, that are part of your legacy, a part of our legacy, and the city's legacy. So I just... You know, I encourage you to really, you know, look at the size of the average units that they remain at a thousand square feet plus. I'm an artist, I know, and I just please, you know, think about the fundamental characteristics of the arts district. Theodore Trentman, Adrian Scott Fine, Kelly Patrick. Good afternoon, Adrian Scott Fine with the Los Angeles Conservancy and here on behalf of our 6,000 members. As much as we'd like to support um, a new and much needed framework and zone for industrial areas like this, the Arts District, the Conservancy cannot at this time. 
Absent any additional conservation tools, the new zone, by making the process easier, jeopardizes the older character and quality of the arts district. FAR and parking waiver provisions for historic buildings don't go far enough, in our opinion, in light of the real development pressures that exist, and these incentives likely won't be utilized as ground-up construction is incentivized at greater levels through this zone. And it fails to address ways to maintain unique and older district characteristics, as there, as there are not adequate safeguards in place because many of the older buildings in the Arts District will fall through the cracks, not able to take advantage of the incentives, and in many cases won't be flagged for sequel review. We are pressing instead for a, a, taking a step back, looking at other ways to ensure there are safeguards in, in place and ways to address the density that could come to the Arts District long term. Thank you. Thank you. I've lived and worked in the arts district for What's your name again? Kelly Patriot. I've lived and worked in the arts district for about 16 years. My business is also here. I'd like to ask you guys to omit us from the ordinance, number one. And number two, two important points for me that have not been addressed is the due diligence aspect. I have not. I was looking for the research on the environmental impact reports from the DOT. Could not find any of that. I'd also like to not force the community to fight every project, project by project, as it comes up through zoning. So I'd like you guys to omit us from this, the arts district specifically, from this, this new zoning, zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> Trevor Glovier, Eric Nathan, Tracy Tynan. Glover. I've been in residence in the Arts District since 2007. I moved in as an artist. One of the things that have made our community, our community is the artists that live there. I stand with the members of the Arts District in the five provisions that they've stated, most importantly on the thousand square feet. As an artist, I've watched many, many of the artists around me leave the neighborhood. People want to come to this neighborhood because of the artists. They're the ones that created it. If we lose these people, we're just like any place else in that LA. So there's plenty of spots in LA. You can build multiple houses, multiple units. Keep the integrity of the arts district, the arts district, and allow artists to stay there. I don't know any artist that can work in a hundred feet. Somebody made mention of a hundred square feet to 250 square feet and they mentioned a computer most of the artists I know do not work off of computers we have supplies we move paint brushes we need space Thank you. Eric. Eric Nathan Tracy Tynan Sandra Menzi McGurley right here Guadalupe Munoz Davis, William Avelman, John Ladner. Hi. Hello. Your name? My name is Guadalupe Munoz Rodriguez. Okay. I work in the Arts District. I do support development in the Art District. However, I do not believe that this ordinance will support the kind of development and housing that is necessary to support local artists. So I'm asking you today to exempt the art district from this ordinance and to make sure that the smallest unit does, does exceed more than 100 square feet and to make sure that there is affordable housing dedicated to the artists who have made the district what it is today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is William Avion. I'm a resident of the Arts District. I've lived here for approximately seven years. I moved here because of the artists and the type of environment, the soul, the heart of the people who walk, live, and work in this environment. And I've looked at this hybrid zone you guys want to create that the planning department, who obviously don't live in our neighborhood, and the suits who just want to come and rape and pillage our environment, please exclude the Arts District from this zone. It provides no benefit to us. I'm one of your constituents. I voted for you. Please protect us. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Menzi McGinley and I'm a business owner in the Arts District. And um, I came to the Arts District because of the environment and its uh, creative uh, atmosphere to do business. Um, one of the things that I want to comment about the stucco boxes, I moved uh, from Texas over 20 years ago and I never saw so many stucco boxes and it was probably the biggest objection to living in Los Angeles. I'm still here, but it's just a turn off, so don't create more of it for, the, for this, this beautiful community that we have. Uh, I'm asking today that you uh, restrict the demolition of the beautiful buildings in the art, Arts District and that whatever you build, you build for multi-use and for reuse so it's not dedicated just to one thing. Um, I totally think that artists deserve uh, low-cost, low affordable housing because it's a creative incubator for them uh, and to keep the spaces at least a 1,000 square feet. I don't know how anybody can really do business as an artist because uh, everything is in computer generation, thank heavens. Uh, and the floor ratio uh, at 1.5, less than 1.5 is important. Thank you. Thank you. John Ladner. Yes, good afternoon. I'm John Ladner. I'm here on behalf of Eileen LLC, a company that owns some beautiful historic property in the Arts District, and also on behalf of its sole owner, Eileen Getty, who would be here instead of me if she were able to be in town. I'm not going to repeat all the very important things that other residents and proponents of the Arts District have already told you, but I think we all think we live in unique communities. What at least to me is really exceptional here is that this unique community is extraordinary in the collective voice that is being presented to you for your consideration, and we can only hope that everyone is listening. I would also suggest that the in my uh, view, just a platitude of historic preservation enforcement mechanisms in the city of L.A. should not be looked to as the saving mechanism in this ordinance. We have all seen how very rarely that very weak enforcement tool has succeeded, and I think it's uh, ingenuous to suggest that that would be the saving grace in this ordinance. So thank you. Thank you. Christy. Christy Jennings Lesowski, Tom Lesowski. Hi there. We are the Lesowski family. We've been in the Arts District for about seven years as well. Pepper was the first biscuit baby in the Biscuit Company Lofts. We love our neighborhood. We love our home. And it's just uh, a, a three more voices of support for this um, for this act and, and that these provisions be made, please, to keep our community the way that it is. Um, the fact that uh, the one to five floor ratio be adhered to, making sure that the average unit size doesn't go below a thousand feet. Please, please make sure that the affordable housing is dedicated to artists so that people can contribute, who have contributed the most to the success of this area, continue to do so. And please make sure that the buildings are constructed with a column beam system to preserve the beautiful building flexibility uh, to change in the future. And please do not allow the demolition of any building constructed prior to 65 unless an approved building permit for the same site is on hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Tom Lasowski. Um, and, uh, and I agree with what a lot of the people who live in this neighborhood have been saying up until now. Um, and uh, just just like a lot of other people, and um, we uh, want to pr preserve the uh, really strong, unique identity of the, the neighborhood. And I, I don't see that happening with this ordinance, so I, I I don't support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Afari, Hamid Bedad, Dale Goldsmith. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Fred Afari from Elm Tree Investment. First, I wanted to thank so much the efforts of the planning department in putting together the draft ordinance, and we request that uh, the ordinance to be adopted. We're fully in support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Eid Bedad, um, 601 South Figueroa Street, Suite 2601, LA 90017. Mr. Chairman, and members of the Plum Committee. We would like to thank you all, as well as the planning staff, for the great effort which has been put in drafting the Lib Work Ordinance. Working with the planning staff, 
we have had few concerns regarding the previous drafts of the ordinance, which are, they all have been positively addressed by the staff in the planning department. As such, we are here to strongly support that you approve this um, uh, ordinance. I also like to speak on behalf of our client that we are totally in support of giving priority to the uh, um, artists as far as accommodating them on the affordable housing if there is no conflict with the um, federal, state, or local law regarding the affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, honorable committee members. My name is Dale Goldsmith. I'm a partner with the law firm of Armbruster Goldsmith and Delvac. I'd like to start by commending staff on the great effort they put in in bringing this ordinance before you. I'd also like to commend you, Chair Wezar, for looking past the rhetoric and seeing what the true issue is here, the most important issue today. This ordinance doesn't rezone a single property. It's merely a zoning tool, and it's a zoning tool that's better than any current zoning tool on the book in that it requires uh, public benefits, including affordable housing, and jobs creation. None of the existing tools have that. Each project that seeks to go through this, to utilize this ordinance, will go through a minimum of four public hearings, minimum. That will allow for ample community input and public vetting that will ensure that all development is compatible and avoid the stucco boxes that many speakers have railed against. I'd also like to say that the minimum 750-foot unit requirement is appropriate. Uh, it's consistent with the ARO. It'll provide for more housing choice, more affordable housing, Larger minimum units will increase affordable housing and foster gentrification. Thank you for your consideration. You. Sheila Newmark, Addy Ben Shahar, Yuval Bar Zemmer. Hello, my name is Sheila Newmark. The Arts District is a special, unique area for artists. I am an artist and I worked with Toby Michelle at Angeles Press in the 1980s and 1990s. I am still involved in arts district activities. I've seen other communities destroyed by bad policy and I do not want to see that happen to the arts district. Please make sure that affordable housing is dictated to decided to artists so that people that contributed the most for the success of this area are not displaced. Please do not also allow the demolition of any building constructed prior to 1965. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adi. I've uh, worked in the downtown area for about 14 years and have relocated my business and residence here uh, in the last three question at hand is whether the Arts District is distinctly different enough from the rest of downtown so that a unique ordinance would be adopted for this area alone. I've lived here and have experienced something that I've never seen before. This zone, this area is bustling like I've never seen anywhere in all of my travels around the world. If downtown has become the heart of Los Angeles, thanks to the efforts of the people who understand how to create a buzz, it is the arts district that is the pulse and the love within that heart that makes it what it is. I urge you to adopt the ordinance that was made by the very people that created that buzz in its entirety. Thank you. Member. My name is Yuval Barzemer. I'm a board member of the Neighborhood Council HCNC. I'm a board member of La Raba, ADCCLA, Friends of the Los Angeles River, and two homeowners associations, so I have a lot of free time. Council Member Huizar, we've been, you've been our leader for a number of years. You know that there is something very special about the Arts District. This is your last term. I don't see how you can afford to leave a legacy other than a forward-thinking policy that takes us to the next century and not takes us 50 years back. Thank you.
this isn't about me. It's about the ordinance. Um, and like I said, I, I, I really, since I'm being put on this, <laughs> being put on the spot about this, again, I'll reiterate what I reiterated before. Any project that gets proposed, whether or not they want to propose to this ordinance or anything else, if a developer wants to get some discretionary approvals, the planning department is going to go to that developer and say, what community benefits can you provide to the community in order for you to be able to get those discretionary approvals from the city? It's a negotiation. All this does is say, instead of negotiate that negotiation to happen, which would happen in any proposal, it says, here's a framework by which if you want discretionary approvals, you have to build this way in terms of size and you have to provide the list of things you could do, affordable housing, etc. All that would go irrespective of this ordinance or not to um, the community. The only thing that's different is that instead of starting each project to negotiate in each project, there's already something that if they want to take advantage, that's there. So the, the negotiation, as opposed to say we're going to negotiate each one, hey, well, we already have this hybrid ordinance. Do you want to take advantage of that? This is what you would have to do. Um, planning department, am I wrong by any? And then, and so your, your time, we, we, we've met several times. and Councilman Michael Grant, for the record, yes. I can address your question. You're absolutely right. Um, we currently have many of the projects that people are reacting to have been done through discretionary actions. And one of my concerns about this area is the compatibility of the existing residential uses with what's currently allowed by right. M3 is our heaviest industrial zone. And we can have manufacturing. We can have industrial plants move in. We can have commercial strip malls move in as a matter of right without any controls. This ordinance gives us a better framework to add new zones to this area, um, being able to do it methodically. And on the heels of this will come a community plan update where this is really a temporary measure to get us through a couple of years while the community plan update for this area goes through where we can pick where the right zones are and appropriate uses to create the job center we have down here while allowing for some residential uses but not predominantly residential. So again, this is a stopgap measure to give us some time to be able to look methodically at projects, but like you said, not have to negotiate them one by one and put in restrictions that require an, a number of employment centers and jobs and a type of building typology that fits well within the area. As you know, all these projects go through a professional volunteer program we have with the AIA for plan amendments that come in where they're rigorously reviewed. Many of the applicants that testified in this room for and against it have gone through that process, and the buildings have come out a lot better, even though they had very good architects on staff. So there's a complete review process that comes on for any project that's discretionary that we go through. Yeah, and in terms of the design, people are concerned about stucco boxes, about the design that it's not going to have the industrial feel. That would be reviewed irrespective of this ordinance or whatnot, whether somebody applies for something, right? And what right. I think lacking here, some communities have opted to, to uh, approve a design overlay zone, which if there's a certain feel characteristic of that community people want to protect, you, you do a design overlay zone, which protects some of those uh, designs that people are concerned about. And, and this community, as many throughout Los Angeles, don't, doesn't have one. Correct, and the one thing that we, we like about this is allowing for that creative nature. We have some of the best architecture firms in Los Angeles, letting them show us to do their best work, to not be so prescriptive that we have kind of an Irvine-type look down here, but to actually allow the creative people that live down here and work down here to design um, buildings and places to cohabitate so that um, it brings it to the next level and allows for new development to mix well with the existing development. Sure. But many of the projects we're seeing come across our desk and talking to us are type one construction. They are more of what we would want to see down here. And this ordinance is that prohibiting gives... them with the one point five or anything else that Correct. some people want. I mean some people could come in here and say this is what I want. Uh, it's not prohibiting that, right? Rather than be afraid of this ordinance, but what really scares me is the a number of uses we allow in the M3 zone that I think people don't really realize if you're living or working next to them, how um, intensified that zone can be. Okay, and you just pointed something out which is interesting. So the pros and cons of get, getting design overlay zone is that you'll have the same design in an area, but it, I mean, you still have some flexibility, but what you just said right now, which is something I hadn't thought about, which in the arts district or any other industrial area like this where you get residents now beginning to live there, that you want to use that creativity so that each project that comes through, they have input as to how that project will be designed, the aesthetics, et cetera. Uh, but, Correct. Okay. We want to be able to allow that creative flexibility um, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. Yes, 
Yes. Patricia Tiefinger for uh, Planning Department staff. I just wanted to reinforce a couple of things that I think uh, came out of the discussion. Um, there's currently no appropriate zoning tool to regulate new construction of mixed-use and live-work projects. The Arts District and other areas that are that have this sort of industrial, hyper-industrial character have largely come about because of the adaptive reuse you know, provisions. Um, there's a section of the code that allows conversion of existing buildings to uh, live-work uses. What we're talking about here is those instances where, we're try where there's new construction being proposed for live work and mixed use and currently the department has you know there's the city has no zoning tool that's appropriate for that oftentimes the uh, the city is faced with um, requests for changes of plant designation and zone to commercial which is more likely to result in some of the kinds of construction that people feel is not appropriate for these kinds of areas. As you noted, uh, Council Member Weezer, I think the key thing is that this ordinance would um, cr change the conversation, would give the city the ability to have a conversation that revolves more around, you know, what is what are the standards that this building has to be built to, what is the mix of uses, and um, that, that doesn't have to be, and the requirements, the public benefit requirements, the affordable housing, all of that stuff is already built into the zone, and it doesn't have to be negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. This ordinance was largely developed in response to the fact that we recognize that in many parts of the city, um, there's a demand. People, the way that people work and the nature of work is changing. They want to live and work in the same place, and we have to sort of, as a city, respond to that. There's a lot of economic advantage to for the city in having places where people can live and work in the same space as long as it's regulated appropriately. Got you. So, at the end of the day, if a community doesn't like a project, whether it's through this ordinance or anything else, they can oppose that project. They don't have to approve it. They don't have to support it. Um, you know, uh, it, it, this ordinance itself is not going to force things upon a community. Currently. Exactly. I, uh, Patricia Diefen, I'd just like to make one more point about the community plan process, that there is a community plan process underway for both of the downtown community plans and many other areas of the city. It is during that process that we can fine-tune policies, fine-tune the zoning. You know, it may be that we have many variations of this hybrid industrial zone, that we have other permutations of it. You know, we might have a hybrid industrial one, two, three, four that can be tailored to different communities, and it's through that process that we can do that. Okay, and, there's, there's, and, and think about the design more. There well. are some currently some buildings that people are using as open spaces for artistic uses, and they're proposing to tear it down and build uh, more density there. Uh, several protections, I would assume. One is if it's built before 1965 and people don't like it, let's not tear it down. And if it's historically designated, it's obviously a lot more protections. And that is a highly discretionary process if it's not designated, designated historically. Uh, designated historical um, I'm put on my record on preservation for example I'm a huge preservationist I wouldn't support something like that or turn that down and the community could also say look we don't like that whether you're going to take advantage of that ordinance or not we don't like the fact that you're going to take down an old building and secondly we prefer this old beautiful building that may be huge and, are, and, and more um, available for the types of artistic uses where people need a lot of space so it, on the other hand you know, it might, there might be another location where there's an opportunity where a developer comes in and says, I'd like to build here, and we're saying, well, we have to rezone it for you. So because we're doing that discretionary approval, these are the things you may have, you, you may, you will have to follow if you take advantage of this ordinance. If you don't want to go down that path, let's negotiate, right? Let's negotiate what are those community benefits. And, and, and at that time, the developer might say, well, no, I don't like that, or, you know, not do it. But there's... Whether or not this we have this ordinance, I assume it's still going to be, leave us in the same place, whether we like projects or not in our dis, in, in the industrial areas. Yes, uh, Patricia Tiefender, for, for the record, just again to summarize, the any project that would involve live work uses in an industrial area would require a discretionary action, would require a plan amendment and zone change, and the question really is, what are the tools available? What are, what are the tools that the city has to? entertain that kind of application and this zone gives us another tool in the toolbox yeah. okay. thank you uh, let me continue with uh, we have a few more public comments Sarah Ramsey Wayne from Encino Dan Grossman good afternoon I'm Sarah Ramsey I'm an 
architect with the firm Y in Culver City, and I'm here with concerns about vulnerabilities in the HI zoning ordinance. I grew up in downtown New York City and personally experienced the transformation of Tribeca, Soho, and Dumbo, all neighborhoods quite similar to the Arts District, and these neighborhoods were able to endure such transformation without losing any of their physical character because the integrity of the building stock and its embedded flexibility was maintained. I see much of the same potential in the Arts District and am excited to be currently working with developers on uh, projects that are committed to maintaining the original industrial character of the neighborhood. However, not all are, and I think we've seen a lot of critique about sucko boxes, and so let's just limit, eliminate type five construction. These wood frame residential buildings lack the resiliency of the great native industrial building stock of the Arts District, and so I think that if we could just make it not allowed, then we'd be able to protect the Arts District and places like it from this type of construction. Thank you. Wayne from Encino. Yes. Exempt the art district. I think that's pretty clear. It's simple. Now, I want to, when you get these developments mixed use, I went to our friends at the Department of Water and Power. Oh, very nice people. So, one of the things you should do in mixed use is make the rates residential and that will give the person living and working the opportunity to pay a residential rate instead of being blown on commercial because the commercial rates are so much more so inside the ordinance instruct the department of water and power on a mixed use bill to meter it at a1a small residential and you give these people a lot of money in their pockets and again they're such nice people over there i mean anybody can go over there and talk you know, they, they won't grab you and throw you out like me. They're, they're very kind people, you know. We live in such a kind city. So exempt the Arts District out of this. Thank you. Wayne from Encino. Dan Grossman. General Jeff. Daniel Kotsek. Kotsur. Hi. My name is Dan Grossman. I'm doing design build for the last 30 years. In the last 13 years, I've been involved in the Art District the activity of a linear city on multiple projects, multiple activity, residential, commercial, etc. First of all, I think that the art district is the only art district that the city of LA has and need to be protected in any means. We need to protect the adaptive views. We need to avoid small units. The typical unit should be a thousand square foot in average, could be larger, could be smaller. If it will be smaller, it should be 5 to 10 percent, not to exceed the amount of unit within the project. The most important, any small units, if there will be a 650 square foot unit, it will drive the price up. It will be against the interest of the residents and the artists. So we need to create an opportunity when you do have few small units, but on a small amount. So please protect the artistry. Thank you. General Jeff, Daniel Kotzer. Good afternoon. My name is General Jeff. I am the chair of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee. And this ordinance is very important to us because Skid Row is neighbors to the Arts District as we're their immediate neighbors to the West. Um, clearly, this, uh, um, this, this item needs to go back to planning for more vetting because uh, planning just eluded that uh, there's potential uh, new variables that uh, could actually uh, be attached to this ordinance. So if the Arts District is hybrid one, Skid Row will be hybrid two. Um, what does that look like? For example, when we talk about the affordable housing, sure there's affordable housing component, but affordable housing in the Arts District is totally different from affordable housing in Skid Row. So what does live, work, low-income housing look like? Because that's what we're going to need in, in, a, in a hybrid two in Skid Row. Um, and, and I can go on and on, but I just want to say on behalf of the Skid Row residents that I represent, we stand in solidarity with the Arts District residents, businesses, and stakeholders who oppose this ordinance as it is. Thank you. Daniel Kotzer, right here. Tom Villa, Jeff Jackson, Sylvia Tidwell. Tom Villa, I'm relinquishing my minute to Sylvia Tidwell. Thank you. Good 
afternoon. My name is Sylvia Tidwell, and I'm the head of the Santa Fe Art Colony Tenants Association. We are a community south of downtown on Santa Fe Avenue. We're not in New Mexico. And we were established 30 years ago with CRA and uh, HUD funding. And I'm here today to support the ordinance. And uh, as I said at the last meeting, that uh, artists are the primary incubators of the culture. Fine artists are the incubators for all the other arts. And the Otis Report on the Creative Economy in California gives figures that there are three quarters of a million jobs in Los Angeles in the arts directly or indirectly, and the arts represent over 10% of LA's total economic output. And so the ideas of the artists feed a huge economic engine, and we urge you to support the ordinance and to add a provision allowing for the rental, the preferential rental of lower income affordable units for artists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeff Jackson. Jet. Jet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm Jet Jackson. I'm a working painter. I've been down here since 1981. I moved into a 150 square foot loft because it was cheap. That was the reason. I'm in favor of this ordinance. Some of my compatriots here may stand up in opposition, and I completely understand why. It's not perfect, but it's realistic. And there are no existing affordable artist housings left to save. More development is inevitable. I'm a pragmatist. Their request to have a thousand square feet spaces for artists can't ever result in them being affordable. I don't think they're realizing that and know what affordable is. We need more seven and eight hundred dollar spaces. We're artists, we're creative. I live above Archer right now in 275 square feet and I make it work because I'm an artist and it's about the rental price per month. It's about affordable housing. It's about the type of construction that will provide that affordable housing. And I'm so sad to be on the opposite side of some of my friends here today. But I really, really need to live in a cheap space. Thank you for your time. Nicholas Castilla, Justin Wallace, Skibben Thornton. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Nicholas Castilla. I'm 23 years old and a recent graduate from the University of Southern California, and I work for Camden currently. And I can't follow up the uh, the way that that was just said, but I was going to speak to the same the same um, subject as the last speaker. I, uh, as a young student or former student living in this city, uh, am just struck by how expensive it is to live here, and it's not any uh, hidden um, hidden fact that if it's very expensive to live in Los Angeles right now, especially for renters. It's actually one of the least affordable rental cities in the country. Um, I don't know how many young people on behalf of the Arts District were here today, but it did not, to me, seem like there are any that were very recent graduates, or if they were, I was, you know, I mean, I would love to speak to them and find out how they make it work. But it's very challenging to live there if you're young, and I don't see very many young artists or many of my young professional friends in any number of industries from music to engineering to architecture none of them live there because it's simply unaffordable so I think this ordinance is wonderful I support this ordinance I think that the uh, minimum unit size is great or the minimum flexible unit size is great and that's all thank you thank you Justin Wallace Walker no. Skibben Thornton no. Marie Ramsey Matus Kowabel, Kowabli, Katrina Hunter, Kim Marie Ramsey's walking up. Is Matus here? No. Katrina Hunter, Mario Maruto, and Patrick Busby is our last speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Marie Ramsey, and I'm here on behalf of the Central City Association. CCA supports the HI zone. The HI zone will provide a clear path for the development of live work units in the Arts District. The Arts District is an important neighborhood in downtown LA. Currently in downtown Los Angeles, there are approximately 50,000 housing units and 500,000 jobs. That is a jobs housing imbalance of 10 to 1 and one of the worst in the nation for an urban core. The HI zone will create a new path for live work units 
and introduce a new housing pro product, and we fully support it. Thank you. I did, did you say that was it? I didn't hear my name. Yeah, right. what's your name? Ted Trentman. Did you turn in your card? Yep. You did? Okay, if you could do me a favor, I mean, go ahead and speak, and then you could turn in your, fill out a card just for the record. Another card? Okay. The city attorney tells me we need these cards. Um, I'm opposed to this ordinance because whatever ordinances that have been permitted thus far have created the situations that are starting to arise in the Arts District, like a lack of parking and our affordable housing in one Santa Fe. As a real estate agent who specializes in downtown, um, I get about 20 calls a day of people who cannot afford to live there. So if that's the solution, it failed. I moved to the Arts District in 1997. I started a company called Loft Living LA in 2001. I started, um, my neighbors started asking me, creative artist types, um, they were scared about the rising costs of rent and they asked me to help them because they learned that I found my loft over the internet. So I started loftlivingla.com to help my artist friends manage the rising costs of rent. Sadly I can say it's 14 years later and um, I can't help artists anymore find affordable housing in downtown. So convince me that the future ordinance will actually provide that. Thank you. You haven't Thank in you the very past. Much. Thank you. We're going to have planning. To... Yes, sir. No sé si me anotaron o no, pero yo quisiera hablar. Hizo una, hizo una carta. Tiene que ser una carta antes del tiempo. Por... Perdón. Pues no. <laughs> ok. <laughs> ok. Puedo hablar. Ok. okay. Hable, hable, hable del tiempo. Okay. Habla inglés o español. Buenas tardes, señores concejales. Mi nombre es Valdomero Capiz, de la organización de Braceros. Translation for me. Okay. Please. Can you do it, Councilman? Yes. Uh, okay. Go ahead. If it, uh... Nosotros apoyamos la ordenanza. La ciudad de Los Ángeles es muy cara para vivir. Nuestra organización siempre ha luchado para mejorar el bienestar de nuestra gente de bajos recursos. Nosotros somos un grupo que defiende el derecho de las personas a viviendas accesibles a bajo costo. Apoyamos la ordenanza porque ayudará a construir las 100.000 viviendas que el alcalde pide para la gente de bajos recursos. Apoyamos la ordenanza porque tiene un componente que incluye porcentajes de viviendas accesibles a bajo costo y moderado. Gracias. Muchas gracias. gracias. Thank you. Bye. Uh, my name is uh, Baldomero Capiz. I'm from the uh, Braceros, uh, the city of LA. It's expensive to live. Uh, we are a group that people help uh, with uh, people with low income. Uh, this ordinance will help us get to the mayor's goal of building 100,000 low income units. Thank you. Okay, that was our last speaker. Any questions or comments? Anything else? Planning department, anything else to add? Patricia Diefendorfer, for, for the record. Um, there were a couple of other issues that were raised. I don't know if um, you want me to go ahead and try to address a couple of them, or if you yes, want, you can, okay. Um, I just wanted to clar uh, clarify a couple of things. Someone mentioned the occupancy load. There's a formula in the, in the ordinance that deals with occupancy load as a way of setting the standard to which the live-work units should be constructed. Um, a couple, I think we covered that a little bit in our opening remarks, but just to uh, clarify, this is something that we're going to continue to work through with um, through the form and legality process with building and safety. We're trying to understand how to better um, write the provision in the ordinance so that it meets the intent, uh, which is to ensure construction you know, that is uh, built to a higher standard, a more commercial standard, but not so much so that it, it starts to become economically infeasible to do so and someone had mentioned that it's 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 not really driven by the full-time residents and employees of these units it's more driven by the um, for what we understand from building and safety about the number of patrons or visitors and the occupancy load when you consider the number of patrons or visitors that would be uh, uh, going to the these buildings so that's just something I wanted to clarify for the record um, also, just to reiterate that the ordinance does have a number of 
provisions that try to encourage, that are aimed at re encouraging reuse of existing buildings, and as we discussed in our opening remarks, with the recent ordinance that was adopted by the city and other uh, administrative procedures, there are many safeguards to ensuring that um, buildings that are of a certain age are reviewed uh, for, you know, making sure that they're not demolished if, if they have some historic significance. I also wanted to just touch quickly upon the artist, the, this idea that the affordable housing should be reserved for artists. Um, this is kind of a complex area. Uh, the ordinance does not preclude that. It is allowed by state and federal law. There are state and federal laws that do, do allow housing to be, low-income housing to be reserved for artists. However, it's tied to some, I think, federal financing structures that are kind of complicated and really haven't been put into practice in the city. So um, it's not, I just wanted to point out that this is something that individual projects can pursue if they're interested in doing so, and they would have to have, go through the appropriate regula regulatory framework that's involved with that. Two, two questions on that, on limiting the affordable housing. So it, it, are there incentives tied to that? So are there funding streams that can be accessed or um, other advantages that can be gained by sequestering the affordable units to people who are artists? And then who gets, who defines uh, who's an artist? So if, you know, if I'm a parent and my child's an artist, but I'm a gardener, am I do I qualify or not qualify? Like, who gets to decide that? Uh, Patricia Diefender, for the record, I think that you've hit upon some of the challenges with um, arts. To, uh, sorry, with um, reserving affordable housing for artists. I, I am not familiar with the funding streams and the processes. I know that there are some ta federal tax credit programs. I don't know that it opens up new funding sources for the city, but there are funding sources that prospective applicants can tap into at the federal level that using those funding sources I think there is some commitment on the part of that developer to reserve the units for um, artists I, I believe that that's something that we would have to spend more time I know that the committee in our last at the last meeting instructed us to do annual reports on this ordinance and to kind of report back about what the, what the ordinance has been yielding in terms of development and, and what we're finding as we try to implement it, that's certainly something that we could report back on in one of these annual um, reports if the committee is interested. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, colleagues, we've heard this uh, item in committee uh, twice. Uh, this item was also heard before in uh, City Planning Commission. I'd, I'd like to request that we approve the revised draft hybrid industrial ordinance uh, with the following additional instructions uh, for the revised section 4.C.4A12 to exempt non-habitable spaces such as mechanical equipment rooms from the minimum floor to ceiling height requirements on the ground level in a manner consistent with the overall intent of the proposed ordinance. That is that there's some mechanical rooms that don't need to fit with the uh, the uh, overall intent of the ordinance on the other requirements yes is that uh, no okay. sorry i just uh, yeah. yes that's, okay that's and fine. number two instruct planning to monitor the development impacts resulting from the implementation of the ordinance and report back to plum on an annual basis until such time as deemed necessary by this committee and three instruct planning to report back to plum within 60 days on the current status of the entire <clears throat> community plan update work program and specifically report back on the central city and Central City North community plans and efforts needed to expedite their completion. And for a request from the City Attorney's Office on the feasibility of um, prioritizing artists in the affordable housing component of this, uh, any uh, use of this ordinance. I think that's it. Um, any objections? Um, so ordered. Thank you. Um, this will now go to Plum, uh, to, to full council. Do we have a date in full council? Uh, this goes to city attorney. City attorney, right? Yes, council. This goes to city attorney. It is. Do, do you want to uh, send it to city attorney, or did you want to send it to full council? My thought was that this is going to full council as a draft, and then you have to, f we, we will adopt it, and then it goes to the city attorney, 
Yes, you, you, you have the option to do that. You, you can send the, the entire, you can send the motion to the full city council, have them consider it, uh, but before they actually adopt it, they have to send it to the city attorney's office for form and legality review. Yeah, we'll send it to council and then come Excuse back me. and we'll most likely waive it out of this committee. We'll take that step when we get there, when it gets back. So you'll send it to council with a directive for city attorney to draft the final ordinance? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Roberto from UC Berkeley, who in Texas Chair, this weekend. This was actually in council and continued to October 6th. Pardon me? This was actually in council and it was continued to October 6th. It, it was, at, okay, it's continued to October 6th, right? Because it was uh, time scheduled before and we postponed it. Okay. Correct. Thank you. This is scheduled to be in council October 6th. Thank you. Any other items on our agenda? Uh, no, Councilman, just public comment. Any public comment? No public comment? I believe, oh yeah, there's one public comment card. Wayne from Encino. Wayne from Encino, always a pleasure to have you, sir. So, again, on these, on these mixed-use units where you have live and work, you have sir, to start... Sir, the law says, it's not just the, from the, the rule in this committee, you have to speak on something that's not on the agenda in the general public comment. That's what I'm talking about, the DWP. Oh, I thought you were talking about the live work. You mentioned the yeah, live work. That, okay. When you when you when you have the metered rates, have the metered rates for live and work as residential instead of commercial, because the commercial rates are so much more than the residential rates. Rather than having two separate meters, meter it for one for both uses, but make it a residential A one A rate. That would save these people a substantial amount of money. Now I tried to talk about that today, but. Unfortunately, uh, they had to use force to throw me out of the meeting. But another thing that DWP is doing is they're holding outreach meetings to create a 5.3% increase in the rates every year for the next five years. So I don't hear you talking about this, but you need to talk about this. I mean, are we going to be raising rates 15% over five years? It's not a good idea. So you need to be getting on, on board because they're moving forward with this next month. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Always uh, look forward to here having you. A public comment. It's closed. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.